God, we, we read and we read and we read and we study and it becomes routine. But I pray today that you will send something fresh to us, that your spirit will fill these words, that your spirit will fill uh, what I have to say, that your spirit will uh, empower us to hear and to listen and to live differently. God, give us the strength to take your word uh, from the Bible and put it into our lives, put it into our hearts. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I have some sad news. It's not real sad, but it's, it's kind of sad. This is our last sermon in the book of Psalms. So any of you Psalms fans in here, I apologize. But those of you who enjoyed it, well, it's been a good time. So if you get your Bibles, Psalms 115. Psalm 115, it's on page 494 in your church Bible. If you haven't already, I'm a big fan of you bringing your own Bibles to church. Now, you can use a church Bible, that's fine. But if you bring your own Bible, you get thumbs up, all right, because you did good. And if you bring a highlighter, you're even scoring more points because you can highlight in there. If you bring a notebook and a pen and you want to take notes, all that is very encouraged. But we have been in the book of Psalms for a couple months now. We've studied lots of different things. We've, we've looked at how the Psalms call us to, to, to fear God, how they call us to honor his name how they call us to, uh, to make a joyful noise to the Lord, to worship Him. Uh, we looked at the, the Psalms written by David, the Psalms written by uh, different guys, uh, Moses, uh, different writers of the Psalms. There's seven or eight different authors to the book of Psalms, spanning about a thousand years between 1440 and 586 BC. Lots of good stuff there in the book of Psalms. But today we're going to look at an interesting question, and it's got a kind of a trick answer to it, but the question is, where is God? Well, that's an interesting question. And the question is posed in this psalm. So without further ado, Psalm 115. And this psalm is, a, is an anonymous psalm. They don't know exactly who the author is. But it was sung as the, uh, the, the, the congregation got together, the, the Israelites got together. And they sang this song before Passover. Now, if you remember your, your history, Passover is a celebration of when God got the people of Israel out of Egypt, and it was the last plague. It's when the, the angel of death passed over the city, and if you had the blood on your doorframe, then your firstborn was spared, and if there was no blood from the lamb, then your firstborn life was forfeited. And so their, their celebration out of uh, slavery into freedom, the, the celebration of Passover, and so they sang this, this psalm before they went, um, or before they celebrated Passover. So, Psalm 115, verse 1. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory, because of your love and your faithfulness. Why do the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk. Nor, that, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. All you Israelites, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. House of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear him, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. The Lord remembers us and blesses us. He will bless his people, Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great, alike. May the Lord cause you to flourish, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to the place of silence. It is we who extol the Lord, both now and forever. Praise the Lord. And so the psalm answers the question, where is their God? But let's start in verse one. Verse one, not to us, Lord, but not to us, but to your name be the glory. I have a hard time reading the Psalms because a lot of them are, are, are turned into contemporary worship songs. And so when I, I read them, I just want to sing them. And I don't sing well, so I'm going to spare you because it's a very joyful noise. Uh, but anyways, the psalmist starts off by not pointing the attention to himself, but pointing the attention to God. He says, bring glory to God in the face of ridicule and disgrace. Bring the glory to God. Now think about this in the context that this is. The, the nation of Israel is celebrating what God has done when they've removed them from slavery. Now, okay, so, so think about this. The, the, the people of Israel, God's chosen people, God, the almighty sovereign God of the universe, the most powerful being ever, and his chosen people, and we're in slavery, and we're getting beat up by Egyptians, 
and, and, and life isn't going good. And that doesn't look real good. I can see the four nations looking at God's chosen people. You know, finally they get out of Egypt and they go into the wilderness. And what do they do when they get in the wilderness? They wander for 40 years because the people don't listen to God. And the four nations are going, what? I thought that was God's nation. Why are they just doing circles? I mean, don't they have directions or I don't think they had GPS, but uh, don't they have some, some idea of where they're going? Why is their all-powerful God leading them in circles? Or the battle of Ai, where they scout out the city and they say, ah, it's just a little city. Just send a couple guys and those couple guys lost their life. This little city beats up the big, powerful, God-fearing nation. I think 2 Kings hits it on the head, verse 18. It says this, this happened, the Israelites were punished because they did not obey the Lord their God. But they violated his covenant. All that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. They neither listened to the commands nor carried them out. And so God said, listen, if you're going to live in sin, and you're going to continue to sin and sin and sin, I'm going to have to do something to catch your attention. And if you don't catch you know, what I'm talking about, it's going to be painful. And so he would let a country come in. In this instance, in 2 Kings, the Syrian army came in and, and captured the Israelites. And I can imagine as Assyria or Egypt or the different foreign nations that have uh, captured and, and enslaved God's people, they feel good about themselves. Well, look at us. We've captured God's chosen people and we're ruling over God's chosen people and their pride builds and builds. And then God says, that's it. All right, they're, they're enough. Time out's over. Oh, I'm going to flip the tables here. And he turns it back. But God, uh, God has let his people uh, be captive. And so the, the four nations, they look and they ask the question in verse 2. They say, where is your God? I, I thought you had this powerful God. Where is he? Either he's, he's not powerful enough. Maybe God isn't really sovereign. Maybe God isn't really all that powerful. Maybe he's, he's not true to his people. Maybe he doesn't really even like you that much. Or maybe he can't be trusted and he's just changed his mind and he's playing for a different team. I, they, 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 they question God. And they say, where's where he at? And they ridicule God and, they, and they, they bring disgrace towards God's name by asking that. Where, where's your God? It's not just when God punishes us. Because sometimes life is just miserable. Sometimes God punishes us. Sometimes it's just bad, just sin. Sometimes just life is busted. Okay? But sometimes we bring embarrassment to God in our sinful actions. Our sinful actions make the world question God. When we're driving erratically in the, the kale of positive and encouraging Christian music bumper sticker on the back of the car doesn't represent the words we just said or the hands that we're waving at those cars in the other lane. That's embarrassing to the name of Jesus Christ. Or the church leader who has an affair and falls from his position in the church, and the, and the world stands around and looks at him and goes, what, what are you thinking? Like, why would you do that to your family or to your wife? Why would you, why would you cheat on her? And, and, and the world looks at us and they say, Where, where's your God? What is, what is God doing for you? Because if we, if we say that we have the truth and the playbook and the rules and the, and the, and the wisdom and the guidance here, and then we just fail at life because of our sinful choices. The world looks at us and scratches their head and says, where is your God? How come he can't help you? How come he can't help your marriage? How come he can't help your family? It's not, something's not adding up. And so we bring embarrassment. We bring scorn to God's name. We bring disgrace and ridicule. And the world looks at us and says, I'm better than you. In a sense, my family is, we're still married. My, my kids are doing better than your kids. Uh, I, I, I don't need God. So where's your all-powerful God? No, no thanks. I'll pass on him. Because they look like they're, they think that they're, they're better than us. And so maybe for us, we need to stop putting God in this predicament where he has to balance punishment and, and grace. I, I would hate to be in God's position. See, God is a God of, of truth and justice, and, and he has to, bring the, has to bring the punishment sometimes on us. But he's also a God of mercy and grace. And when does he provide punishment and correction, and when does he provide mercy and grace? I love what David said in Psalm 101. We looked at this one last week. Psalm 101, I will sing of your love and justice. I will sing of your love, your grace, 
and your justice, the times that you punish me, God. To you, Lord, I will sing praise, and I will be careful to lead a blameless life. I think that's the key. Instead of putting God in this predicament where he's got to balance punishing us or giving us you know, grace, and you don't want to give too much grace because then you've got these wild, rebellious Christians that do whatever they want to do. But if we could just choose to live a blameless life, to stay away from sin, to not put God in that place where he's embarrassed, where it looks bad, where the world looks at us and says, where is God? What's the church doing? This doesn't seem like it's helping them at all. Maybe we should ask ourselves, is this action or choice going to bring glory to God? Because essentially that's what the psalmist is saying. Look at verse one again. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. He's not saying, I don't want to be embarrassed. He's not saying, I look foolish now living in this sinful choice. He's saying, God, we want you to be glorified. We want you to be praised. The nations look around and scorn us and say, where's God? I want them to see that it's your name that's revered, your name that is held high. And so the world looks at us, and there's another aspect to this question, this question of where is God, and we'll look at that in a bit here. But the world looks at us and says, okay, so we, we don't see God because he's obviously not working for you right now. So let's choose to worship something else. Let's try verse four. Maybe we'll try verse four. And so the world turns from God because they don't see him, and they go to verse 4. They have idols that are silver and gold made by human hands. Verse 5, they have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, nor they can utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. And so the world says, God's not working, so maybe I'll turn to trusting in false idols. The world trusts in false idols. And I want you to underline the word world, okay? The world trusts in false idols. As Christians, we should be beyond that. And as we read this passage of Scripture, we think, oh, how silly. No one would actually carve a false god and, and pray to it or worship it. We're so much smarter and better than that. But what has mastered our lives? What do we currently worship? We think, well, I don't, I don't worship anything. Let me ask this question. What has mastered your life? Education? Education is it. Education is the focus, the drive. I need to be educated. I need to get as much education as possible. And that has become your idol. Maybe it's success. I'm going to climb to the top of the corporate ladder. I'm just going to get do whatever I have to do to get to the top, the top, the top, the top, more, 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 and you worship success. You worship money. I need more. I need more. You worship yourself, ourselves. We can make ourselves into an idol. I think verse 1 is very appropriate. Not to us, not me, not the glory for me, God, the glory to you. And so we think, we think oh, false idols, these these carved graven images that's silly that's child's play but i think idolatry is much more prevalent in our nation today in our world today than we think alcohol depression the different things that have just destroyed our lives that we can't get past that's taking our lives from us and verse 8 listen to verse 8 those who make them will be like them and so will all who trust in them they'll be like them well those verses before everything that they said about idols well, they look like this, but they can't do it. They have mouths, but they can't talk. Ears, but they can't hear. They essentially, they do nothing. They're not going to help you at all, period, the end. It's completely empty. And if we follow and worship after empty things, then we will be as such. And so if we worship money, if we worship possessions, if we worship things in this world, it's going to be empty, and it's going to leave you with nothing. And so that's not the answer. The world can... The world shouldn't, but the world does trust in idols, but we don't. We don't do that. And so we have to revisit the question, where is their God? And I love the answer in this. Of all the, as I was reading through the, the book of Psalms, and I was saying, okay, this is the last sermon in the book of Psalms. Which one am I going to choose? Holy Spirit, which one do you want me to preach? I couldn't get away from verse 3. Verse 3 just kept coming up in my head. Excuse me, verse, yeah, verse 3. It just kept coming up. And I love this verse. Where is God? Verse 3, our God is in heaven, and he does whatever pleases him. Oh, what a great response. I like that verse a lot. God is in heaven and he does whatever pleases him. And so God is there. And now that's kind of a trick question because when we say, where is God? We think of location because we're, we're people, we're objects, or we're, we can only be in one place at one time. Unless you're a mother, 
Mothers are crazy how they seem to be in all places at all times. That's a God-given gift. Men don't have that. That's why we're responsible for doing less around the house. Okay, anyways. <clears throat> God is not, he's not a person. God's infinite. God, God can be everywhere. He's omnipresent. That's a big, huge word to mean that God can be everywhere at all times. See, we think location. We think John Milliken is in the sound booth. So John can't be back there because he's in the sound booth. But God can be in the sound booth. And he can be in Indiana. And he can be in Africa. And he can be on his throne in heaven. And so we listen to verses like Isaiah 66. Now read this. Isaiah 66, verse 1. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. And you go, oh, that's how big God is. I mean, you see God sitting up on heaven, his feet are on earth, and then there's the rest of him. But he's bigger than that. He's just, he's just huge. And so God, God is in heaven, but yet he's here with us. The omnipresence of God, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Jesus is about to leave his disciples. And he looks at his disciples and he says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the ages. Now, how can Jesus look at all of his disciples and say, I'm with you all, and look at us and say, I'm with you all, and look at everybody and say, I'm always with you always to the very end of the age, and I'm sitting at the right hand of my Father at the same time? Jesus is on the present as well. How does the Holy Spirit do it? The Holy Spirit is in all of us at the same time. It's a big God. And so God is in heaven, but he's here as well. It's kind of a trick question there. But God is in heaven, and the highest office reserved for him and he's doing what he desires. God is in heaven and he does whatever he pleases him. Have you prayed this prayer? Where are you, God? Why are you not here? When life just falls apart and your, 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 your car is broken, you come home and it's not the response you're looking for. And you're like, God, where are you at? This is not what I was looking for. And we pray that prayer. Sometimes we don't know what God is doing how he's acting. But these are some of the things that we know about God. And God is sovereign. God is the sovereign, supreme, all-powerful ruler of the entire universe. Now, sovereign is not a word I use uh, ever, okay? It's just not a word that we use frequently. But, but think about that. God is sovereign. God is the highest power indefinitely, ever. And he has all control. And so he can... He can he, can always, he always wins. He always wins. He's always in control. When Satan thought that he beat God by destroying his son, that didn't, he didn't win. He's coming back to life. You actually worked for me. God is in control at all times. I think of the story when Jesus is on the boat sleeping with the disciples, and the disciples are going crazy. They're like, Jesus, there's a storm. We're going to die. And Jesus is snoozing. He gets up. Hey, you guys should just chill out. It's calm. He's sovereign. He's in control of everything. And so when life is just getting crazy, remember, God is sovereign. God's in control. And God is also, well, this is kind of interesting, God uses the sinful and the righteous to bring about his goodwill. God uses the sinful and the righteous to bring about his goodwill. And that's good, because we like to, we like to serve and do things for the kingdom, and so we've got the great giveaway coming up, an opportunity for us to serve, and so we're trying to do good. We're trying to be righteous and, and, and do the will of the Father, but at the same time, God also uses sinful people. People are trying to work against God uh, to bring about his glory. You think about um, the angry mob that tried to, that did, that succeeded in killing Jesus. That's grievous sin. They're killing the Son of Man. But God was using them. That would burn me up if I was fighting against God, if I was, if I was trying to fight against God and trying everything I could do to thwart his plans. And once it was all said and done, I say, fine, there you go, take that, God. And he looks at me and he goes, thank you. That's exactly what I wanted you to do. Oh! But that's what God does. He uses the righteous and the sinful to bring about his goodwill, what he desires. God can prevent, allow, direct, and or limit sin, but never causes it. Now that's a mouthful. Let's talk about this for, for a second. God can prevent sin. He can step in and just say, that's it. No more sin. Done, period. You, you've gone far enough. I'm stopping this. I'm stopping it from happening to your life. I'm stopping this sin from happening to others. God can prevent sin. He's powerful enough to do that. God can allow sin. We live in a world of free choice, free will. Because we're free to choose to love God or free to reject God, 
That rejection of him is sin, and that sin causes suffering for others. And God allows that. God can direct sin. This uh, really smart, educated theology book that I have, I was reading this and, and studying about this, and it used the word that God is a, a, a master at judo. <laughs> I thought, now that's an interesting way to describe God. But God can take what you try to attack him with and redirect it, as in the art of judo. And God can redirect sin. We try to fight against God, and it ends up being a blessing for him. And God can limit sin. He can do all those or a few of those simultaneously, whatever. He's sovereign. He can do which one he wants. But he never causes sin in the book of James. God doesn't cause sin. God is sovereign. And this is one that I think that we forget, that I forget frequently, that God has a different perspective on life than we do. God has a much different perspective on life. We see what's right in front of us. I think that's why the world turns to idols, because we can't see God. Where's God? I don't see him, but I can see this. I can see money. I can see fame. I can, that kind of makes me feel good, so I can worship that. But God sees the big picture. He sees the, the grand perspective of it. We went to, uh, to Akron Zoo uh, when we did the Akron Marathon. And uh, so it's this nice little zoo, and we're tooling around the zoo. And there was the kids' train section, so the kids get on the train, and there was a school group that was coming rapidly. So I'm like, okay, let's go, scoot along. And after the train section was this little kids' maze. And have you ever been in one of those, like the corn mazes or the, 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 the big shrub bush mazes where you're not supposed to walk through like Moses in the Red Sea? You're not supposed to do that, but I do. Um, but really, it, it's easy for me because I'm tall, so I can see over the top, so that, that works. But this little kid's maze, it was, it was nice, it was, it was easy, but I, it was about to hear on me. So I could see the whole thing. I'm looking, and I'm like, okay, don't go that way, that way, go that way. And I had a different perspective on it. I could see which way was going to lead to the end, and how to get there, and how to get to the barn owls, which are barn owls. But God looks at our life, and he sees it from a completely different perspective. And he says, oh, if you go this way, that's going to lead you to life. That's going to lead you to wisdom, to growth. That's going to lead you home to being in heaven. And all we see is, this hurts, this is a wall, God, get this out of my way. And he's saying, go right. And we're going, ah! When we have a different perspective, we trust God. And we let him guide our lives. And so remember that God has a different perspective on our life. He sees the end. We should be reminded of that. And God is always working for our good. God is always working for our good. Romans 8, 28, and we know in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God is doing good in our life. It might be painful now, but he's going to bring about something good from it. He sends miracles. He listens to our prayers. He does. He does good things for our life. But I wish there was a formula. I wish it was easy. Two prayers, three church attendance, blessing equals done, period, the end. It doesn't work like that. The mysteries of God are just that. They're mysteries. We don't know why or how he works. But we know that he does and that he brings about good and that he lets us take an active role in it. And so the rest of the chapter here is they answer the question, where is God? The rest of it calls us to what we should do. Verse 9. All you Israelites, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. House of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and shield. You who fear God, that's us. You who fear God, trust in the Lord. He is our help and shield. The idea of fear is this, this reverence, this respect that we give to God because he is the supreme, the only supreme ruler of this universe. So we trust in God. Verse 12, the Lord remembers us. He's not going to forget us, six, seven billion people in the world, yet he remembers you, little you in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. He remembers you and your concerns. And he will bless you. He will bless his people, uh, Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, small and great alike. May the Lord cause you to flourish, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to mankind. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, those who go down to the place of the silent. It is we who extol the Lord, we who lift him up, both now and forevermore. Praise the Lord. And so we who fear the Lord trust and praise God. We trust him because he's got a plan, and his plan is going to win, and his plan is the best plan possible. And so we trust and we rely on his plan. We say no to idolatry. We say, that's not going to lead me to life. I'm going to follow the plan that God has. 
But I think we get hung up in verse 12 through 18. Verse 12, listen to this. The Lord remembers us and will bless us. He will bless us. I want to know how he's going to bless me. I'd like to know, God. Can you tell me how you're going to bless me? Or can, can I, excuse me, can I just ask you specific ways that I would like you to specifically bless me? I would like to be blessed with this house. I would like to be blessed with this car. I would like to be blessed with this job. I would like to be blessed with this health. I would like to be blessed with these things on earth. I would like these blessings. And, and it, as I see all these lists of blessings, it looks like a Christmas list. And I can hear God looking at us and going, wasn't the cross enough? I can hear God look at us and say, wasn't my son's life sufficient? And you step back and you feel selfish and you feel greedy. And you go, you're right. We got the cross. We got Jesus Christ. Look, I could buy you a car. I could buy you a house. I cannot buy you salvation. I can also not give up my son for your life. Sorry, I like you and all. You're nice people, but it's my son. But God looks at us and says, I love you so much. I'll give you my son to die on the cross, to pay the ransom, to bring about salvation. Is that blessing enough? That should be more than enough, church. What, what do we need from there? You can keep everything else. We've been blessed with the cross, with salvation, with Jesus Christ. I'm completely content, and I need nothing more. And so when the world asks, where's God? I can say he's in heaven and doing whatever he pleases. And you know what he pleased to do? He desired to have a relationship with me, and that's why he sent his son to die on the cross for my life. That's my God. That's the one I serve. Who do you worship?